Good evening, everyone. Today is Monday, April 9th. Um, this is the Administration and Public Works Committee. We have a quorum, so we are going to get our meeting started. Um, Audit Member Braithwaite, can you take us through the approval of minutes? Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to motion to approve the February 26, 2018 minutes, as well as the March 19, 2018 minutes. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Um, Alderman Suffernan, can you do the payroll? Thank you. Uh, I move approval of uh, the payroll from February 19th, 2018 through March 4th, 2018 in the amount of $2,762,402.14. Uh, I also move the payroll from March 5th through March 18th in the amount of $2,780,773.27. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All the po any opposed? Uh, Motion key. Item A2 is the bills list or March 27th in the amount of $1,399,302.89. And April 10th, 2018 in the amount of $4,292,911.16. I move approval. Second. Thank you. Alderman Rainey, you have a question? I do. Um, Madam Chair, I, I'd like to have a discussion or an explanation from staff briefly on um, Corbinize, um, the PNZ engagement tool. I'm not <clears throat> sure if we've canceled their services or just on this one uh, development. I, I don't quite understand. Somebody explain. All right, Steph. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, with Coburnize, it's an online platform that we were using on a trial basis for the, the first plan development we used it for was the 1450 Sherman, the Albion development. Uh, that plan development has concluded, so we've canceled it for that plan development. Uh, we used it for one other plan development, the 601 Davis. Uh, since then, uh, we've, we've moved on and we're uh, using another uh, public engagement tool, Civic Comment. So that's the one we're using currently for 1727 Oak, as well as the 128 Chicago Avenue. Okay, so we're not using them anymore at all. That's correct. Okay. All right. um, thank you. I have another question, and okay. that is on the hotel tax. Um, we have um, a hotel who uh, overpaid their hotel tax by fourteen thousand six hundred and thirty-six dollars and fifteen cents. Uh, that's a pretty huge overpayment of a hotel tax. So I asked a bunch of questions and I'm told it's none of your business. We don't reveal that kind of information to lowly aldermen or anybody else. Uh, what I want to know is um, somebody in the law and the <coughs> finance department knows exactly how much they should be paying. Is that correct? Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. That is correct, Alderman Rainey. Is that right? That's correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, Surely there's a formula for how much they pay. Correct. How, how about when an alderman is so interested in this detail, why wouldn't you say, look, hotel tax is, here's the formula for a hotel tax. We can't tell you anything specific, but the hotel tax is like 10 cents on a dollar. And, and we figure it based on the number of rooms times the number of, I mean, something like, what, what's the formula? Correct. Uh, then I apologize. The, the question I thought didn't it, pertain it, to the rate. It was. It was. But you told me you couldn't answer my question. But you would ask for specific. Yeah, well, it, I want to tell me what is the formula. Sure. It's 7.5% of the gross receipts that the hotel charges. Basically, the room times 7.5%. Okay, and do we do audits of these hotels? I mean, I, see, I find it absolutely unbelievable that they could have overpaid this because th th this is just a huge amount for them to have overpaid and not said immediately before they sent in this check, oh, <laughs> he overpaid. Correct. It's, I, I don't get it. I, it's fishy. 
Right, we, we did audit the return information that they provided. They provided the gross receipts for the year and confirmed with the number of rentals that they did overpay it at 8.5% rate as opposed to 7.5% rate. So this was vetted through both accounting and revenue before the refund went on to the bills list. It's an incredible amount of money to overpay. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No further questions? All right, we had a motion and a second. Uh, those approved for the bills list. Oh, uh, one other. Okay. I, have, I do have one other. Okay. And that's on this whole passport fiasco. Could somebody please explain the passport, the parking, uh, uh, the city's vendor of passport parking? Do we have a staff who can address that? Um, Where's Jill? No, Matt. No. I want to know okay. all about this. And I mean, this is back from August. And, has to Madam Chair, um, members of the committee. Uh, so when the bills were submitted and the invoice was submitted to the city in March again, it was the first time Passport had contacted the city in regards to the invoices. Um, prior to the invoice that they sent in the months that were being um, mentioned in the, which is August, um, November and December, I'm sorry, August, October and, October and November, they were sent to a prior employee. And so that information did not get into the bills list at the time because of the transitioning that was occurring. And um, Passport did not update their records to make sure the appropriate staff person was receiving the invoice. And so what ended up happening is we received the September invoice only because the new parking manager was in communications with an employee and they gave that they gave the employee the invoice at the time however their processing system did, was not updated to give the correct um, email and so in that case it kept going to the prior employee and not coming to the new the new employee that was supposed to be receiving the invoicing and unfortunately, they did not provide us or did not follow up after the first or two invoices weren't paid um, prior to inform us that they weren't paid until March. And so we were not aware of the discrepancy until we were informed at the end of March, which is why they're in the bills list. There's something wrong with our accounting if this can happen when we have three three major payments do that we miss <coughs> and I, I, I think we should well we have addressed that so that in the future this will not occur again mm -hmm. um, however at the time we were not aware that this happened and so um, it definitely was a mess but we do have now in place a process so that redundancy in case someone is not able to receive emails we have a backup mm -hmm. so that has been implement it and in the future this should not happen again. Okay. Any further questions? All right, so we had a motion and a second for approval of the bills list. All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. aye. Thank you. Any opposed? All right, so that passes. Alderman Rainey, may, can you do item 3-1, um, please? Okay. Um, a3.1, uh, we're being asked to request to the council uh, to approve a renewal agreement with Express Press to supply clothing for the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Summer Program in an amount not to exceed $24,500. This is for action. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Seeing no lights, no questions. Um, can all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Um, item 3.2 is an agreement with Evanston Township High School to supply school lunches for the 2018 summer food program. The staff recommends that council authorize city manager to execute an agreement between the city of Evanston and Evanston Township High School. This agreement is to provide lunch meals for 2018 summer food program in the not to exceed amount of $3.25 um, per lunch. This is a reimbursement program in which the total amount of the reimbursement the city will receive is solely dependent on the number of meals served um, and varies dependent on the level of participation. Funding is budgeted in the business unit. 
um, recreation outreach program where program expenditures are charged back and revenue credited. There's 130, excuse me, $125,000 allocated for this program, um, of which $15.79 has been expended, and this is for action. Second. Second. Thank you. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Alderman Braithwaite, can you do A3.3, please? Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move for action. Sidewalk Cafe, French Kiss Cafe at 1517 Dempster Street. Uh, staff's recommending the City Council approve for the first time application for this sidewalk permit for French Kiss Cafe, their Type 2 restaurant located at 517 uh, Dempster Street. Second. Thank you. Alderman Rainey? Um, I want to make a comment on behalf of one of my constituents having to do with A3.3 and A3.4. I realize uh, French Kiss is just two little teeny tables, <laughs> two chairs. Um, but um, my constituent asked me to mention that it is she loves outdoor seating. Mm -hmm. But it is getting more and more difficult, she says, to traverse the sidewalks where there are these little added cafes. And that it's um, important for the restaurateurs to be careful about keeping the chairs and the tables back so that people can walk by, especially people with baby carriages and wheelchairs and people who are obeying the law by walking their bicycles. And anyway, she says it's getting very difficult for pedestrians to walk down the sidewalk. Chair. I, I'm, um, I'm the messenger. Right. Yes. I'm the messenger. <laughs> so one of the changes that we made this year is that we're requiring that the site plan be affixed to the window, it would be posted in the window. So we do have um, one of our field inspectors that does check these layouts. So if the, the, you know, the site plan is in the window, it makes it easier for everybody to make sure that it is compliant. We require six foot separation between the sidewalk cafe and any other fixture on the sidewalk. So um, we'll just be diligent in making sure that you know, these layouts are per approved plans. And can I just add one more thing? I wasn't, I didn't think about it until now. I I had a similar complaint last year, and it re, about downtown Evanston, where there's the outdoor cafe seating, and then we have the beautiful planters. That sometimes the outdoor seating starts to croach over, and so you have even a smaller space because there is one of the very lovely planters. And this was from someone who um, is visually impaired, and so uses a walking stick, and found it very difficult to maneuver downtown Evanston in certain spaces. So if we could just be mindful of the planters as well. Definitely. Thank you. All right, so there was a motion and a second. All those in favor of item 3.A, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Alderman Ruth Simmons, can you do 3.4, please? Sure. Uh, staff recommends. Sorry about that. Staff recommends City Council approve a first time application for a sidewalk cafe permit for Rock and Ravioli, a type two one rest a type one restaurant located at ten twelve Church Street. The sidewalk cafe will consist of six tables with two seats, each for a seating capacity of twelve, and will operate Wednesday through Sunday from eleven AM until ten PM. This is for action. Second. Thank you. Seeing no lights, all those in favor will say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, 3.4 carries. Um, Alderman Suffern in 3.5, please. Sure. Uh, item 3.5 is uh, contract to provide a street condition evaluation and right of way asset management with Infrastructure Management Services LLC in the amount of $206,720. Second. Um, any, any questions? Yeah, I've got a couple. All right, Alderman uh, Suffern, and then off. Uh, could you just help me understand exactly what this includes and why it's uh, worth $206,000? Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair and members of the committee. Dave Stomach, Public Works Director. Uh, the main cost of this is to do a street pavement assessment. So they use a very technical truck that has uh, laser scanners on it as well as uh, five to six cameras. So as they're driving down the street, they can 
uh, clearly identify every crack in the street, and that helps to do the, the rating of the street. In addition, they also use a non-destructive testing of the road base. They basically drop a, a weight onto the street, and they measure the vibrations to determine how sound the, the road base is. So this is a tool that uh, engineering's been using since 2000 to rate the different streets. Prior to that, it was very subjective. You send a staff employee out, and they kind of look at it, and they can't see all the different cracks that a laser could pick up, and so it was very subjective. And we didn't feel like we were actually getting the, the worst streets addressed. So that's why in 2000 we switched to this type of a process. So it's a very technical type of process that's used. It takes out the human factor, and it can give you some really good uh, reports and rating of the streets. So they, they combine the, the deflections, the cracking, the, the base of it. There's four different factors that are used to come up with a street rating, and it's on a scale of zero to 100. Uh, in Evanston, we generally have streets that are rated below 50, and we address those streets first, and then we start addressing the ones that have a rating between uh, 60 and 70. Uh, a brand new street would have a rating of 100, like Sheridan Road would have a rating of 100. So we don't plan to do any of that. I mean, we're going to do that, but we wouldn't do any repair work to it. And then based on the type of issues that they find with the street, we determine what type of, uh, well, the engineer recommends, and we generally follow their recommendation, what type of reconstruction we should we do. Do we have to do base replacement? Can we just mill and resurface? All those type of factors are discussed as we do this. Uh, at the once the work is completed, we come back to the city council. We share the the results with them, and we get concurrence that we want to. Or in the past, we've gotten concurrence that we want to address the streets with the worst rating than the other ones. And a long time ago, we used to pick a street from each ward, and then some wards would suffer because they have more miles in their ward than in other wards. So this is a very good way of, of determining which streets need to be resurfaced, and it gives us very good accurate information on that. Uh, we also plan to do some other work with that, and, and one is to take a sign inventory. So as I indicated, this vehicle has five cameras on it. As they're driving down the street, they get an image of that. We get uh, a picture of every 10 feet on the street from that video recording, and then you can read the signs, and we can have all of our signs placed into our GIS so we know which signs are there and that, and what they say, which is good for us for when we have to replace signs. We just know what the number of signs are. Uh, when we had to replace the street sweeping signs, we were guessing as to how many signs there were in each zone. This will allow us to have an accurate count for that. Uh, pavement markings is another uh, inventory that we'll do. Uh, you're aware of all the double yellow striping or skip white striping and, and actually the parking spaces. So an item later on the agenda today is pavement marking, and we go and we try to divide the city up into five areas, and we refresh the pavement marking again as we visually observe it. This way, we'll have all the pavement markings done there, and we'll know when they were last done. So if we were for in area one, we don't get all the striping within that area. We only get so much of it. But we'll know what we missed so that five years later we know which our priority is to get that time around. Uh, How do we pay for it? We last we lasted this five years ago, back in 2012. It, it, it was 2012. Was it CIP or? Yes, it's our geo bond. Okay, and that's how that's how it's been done. Yes, and that's like the, the best way to do it. Or is there another source of revenue somewhere? I, mean, I, I don't believe there's another source yeah. of revenue that we could get a grant to do this or anything like okay. that. Okay, I mean, in your opinion, this is uh, we. Save two hundred six thousand dollars in lost efficiency, and uh, this is worth it. Correct. What in, in our opinion, this is it makes it fair to get the streets resurfaced that it need the most attention. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'll I'll just follow up, Dave, and just along the lines of question with Alderman Suffered, I think we're all up here very concerned with our budget talks. I mean, we're starting yes. them early. I've heard is. Low as three, as high as six, and excuse me, as, low, as high as five, and possibly six million. So, I mean, just talking to some of my colleagues, we're going to be paying really close attention to some of the things that you know staff is presenting. And so, I don't know if the five years is an industry standard. Um, I'm assuming since I've been on council, I you know you've been very good about 
forecasting what roads to be needs to be done and a lot of that is based on the water main projects as well so i'm going to ask a stupid question just given the really tight budget constraint what if we pushed out whatever data that you collected five years ago to six years i mean are we really going to be losing efficiencies with waiting another year to do this assessment i mean i see it as a way of two hundred and six thousand dollars is a lot of money that's probably a couple of staff or some real critical services so that's my question for you it, it, sure it could be pushed out another year we can take the the streets that have the lowest rating from last time we, that we did this right however there's probably some streets that are now in worse condition than the streets that we have so fair enough you, you could have some streets that would be rated at 50 now yeah that weren't rated at 50 five years ago yeah but we're not going to address those because we're going to be working on the streets that are now rated between 60 and 70. Sure. So uh, another way of looking at this, and council can do is say, please, the, the street rating is about $140,000. And if you divide that by five, mm -hmm. that's how much you're actually paying a year to get this work done for you. So uh, we're already kind of stretching. Mm -hmm. We're already, you know, in engineering, we're already starting to look at what streets sure. should be resurfaced in 2019 because we we go out and we try to TV inspect the sewer mains that are underneath them. We have to figure out the width. We have to if we're going to widen them. We want to make sure the aldermen are in, in favor of that before we actually start design. So 2019 streets are already. We we met today to start talking about 2019 streets. Sure. And all the MFT streets that get resurfaced also are evaluated based on this. So you know there's street resurfacing other than the water main. There's street resurfacing done by MFT and by CDBG as well. And all those, how we select those get uh, considered from this rating. Right. But absolutely, we could wait a year if that's the right. council's. Uh, I guess prior to, to thank you, Dave, for that response. Ed, we're going to have to figure out a whole lot of money, and I would much rather, you know, use these meetings as an opportunity to really push our staff to figure out what things could potentially wait. And I know that you're excellent at budgeting, and there's probably an efficiency with going five years out but just given our budget constraints i think that not an engineer but i'm going to assume that you probably f since 2012 you have a list of streets that really need our our attention and i guess i would start with that list of whatever streets and then just focus on those because i don't even know where our cip budget is going to be this year and so that's what i would consider all right, I guess that's what I would ask the committee to consider. Um, this may be a project that we can hold at least over till next year mm -hmm. and utilize the previous data. All right, Alderman Rainey had a question as well. Um, Dave, one of the things that I've heard over the years is that we we do what some other communities don't do, and I'm, I'm not sure Chicago does it, is that we extend the life of a lot of our, our paving projects with crack sealing. Is that is that true? Yes, that is correct. Uh, we have, actually we're starting a third way of uh, trying to uh, lengthen the streets. There's the crack sealing, that's on the uh, award for tonight. Uh, at the last council meeting, you approved uh, patching work. So we, we spent $600,000 patching streets as well. And then uh, later on this year, and we did a pilot program last year, we use a rejuvenation project, which uh, a year after you resurface the streets, you go back in and you put uh, more uh, bituminous product into it, some more chipstone, and that will extend the life of those streets as well. However, we Evanston can never keep up with with replacing streets as frequently as we should. So we generally allocate 1.1 million to 1.2 in MFT and 1.1 in uh, CIP funds for street resurfacing. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.4 million. If we really want to try to get our streets up to something where all streets had a rating of 60 or higher, we would have to spend way more than that uh, funding annually to be able to do that. So uh, at the funding level that we currently have, we're, we're really only addressing the streets that have a rating below 50 and sometimes between 50 and 60. So uh, it's, it's setting the standard of how good our streets are in Evanston. We're trying to stretch the life by doing all these other measures as best as we can. All right, seeing no further lights, I'll call. 
Thank you. Um, call the roll. All those in favor of where we at? Uh, item 3.5, say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. All right, goes four to one. Um, Alderman Rainey, can you take 3.6, please? Yes, um, thank you. Um, we're being asked to request the council authorize the manager to execute a one-year contract extension for crack ceiling service with uh, Patriot Pavement pavement maintenance in the amount of $80,000. This contract um, is one of those awarded by the uh, Municipal Partnering Initiative. I move approval. Second. Second. I just got a quick question. Yes, Alderman Sorry, I, I should have just asked it before. Um, my apologies. Are, are these the like squiggly little worms that end up in the parkway after the first plowing? Uh, not all of them wind up in the parkway after the first plow. We, it, it, this is, we go out and we, uh, you route out a crack that exists and then you put an asphalt material in there. Sometimes if, if water gets in there before they put the material in, which generally doesn't happen, it will pop out. But uh, it, it has, it, it's very good. I, it works 98% of the time. There are some Yeah, this is the question because I've had people point them out to me before, and I'm like, I don't. Uh, like, the, the crack is still sealed. It's just the plow took off. Right, and, and sometimes uh, you, you do this, and it, it, we've been doing this now for more than five years, so I'm going to say that some of the streets that we did this on five years ago, the crack right next to the original crack has gotten worse and expanded. Now water's getting into that same void area and it's starting to freeze thaw underneath it and popping this, the uh, sealer out. Okay, but this is, that's, so, this is what we're talking about. This I'm is sorry. one of our maintenance to try to extend the life of, the, of streets. Okay. And we find it, we have found it to be beneficial. Great. Thank you, sorry to make you. Yeah, no worries. I have a question. So when you just talked about this last thing, Ottoman Braithway brought up this, the, or Ottoman, um, sorry, Rainy no brought up the no. crack ceiling as a way to prolong the street. So are these streets chosen based on the last evaluation we did in 2012? Uh, these are, the streets that we were doing on this time were resurfaced between 2010. There's three streets resurfaced in 2010, two in 2012, one in 2013, and one in 2014. So we, we look at the streets that were resurfaced within the past five years. This is subjective. Our guys go out and look at it and say, oh, this street needs the crack ceiling now. So it, it's it, a lot of times when we're just milling and paving the street, you don't correct the base as well as you should have. And then the the cracks deflect through the asphalt, the road base cracks deflect through the asphalt, and that's what we're trying to seal when we do this work. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no more lights, this has a most, uh, motion and a second. All those in favor of item 3.6 say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Item 3.7 is the contract extension for 2018 with Precision Pavement Marking Incorporated for Pavement Marking Program. The staff recommends City Council authorize City Manager to execute a one-year contract for pavement marking with Precision Pavement Marking Incorporated in the amount of $92,000. This is part of a bid through the Municipal Par Partnering Initiative. Funding will be through the 2018 Capital Improvement and Parks System Funding um, and the with a budget of $175,000, remaining balance right now is $85,000, and the parking system has a budget of $2,450,000, with a remaining balance of $2,128,321. This is for action. Second. Thank you. Any questions? All right, seeing no questions, all those in favor for... Um, Item 3.6, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Alderman Braithwaite, 3.8, please. <clears throat> yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move uh, a single source purchase of a riding mower uh, from, what is that, Renders, Inc. Uh, staff recommends City Council authorize City Manager to execute this purchase uh, for a Toro Groundmaster riding mower, uh, and that's in the dollar amount of $21,997.70. Second. Seeing no lights. All those in favor of um, 3.8 say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
All right, motion carries. Alderman Ruth Simmons, can you please take 3.9? Sure. Staff recommends city approval of the purchase uh, of the purchase of a Ford SUV outfitted with lights, sirens, and other necessary equipment for operations. This is a replacement vehicle for Evanston Police Department Patrol Unit 41, 2014 Ford SUV, as it was in an accident and the insurance adjuster deemed the vehicle totaled. The replacement vehicle will be purchased from Curry Motors in the amount of 28486 and outfitted by Havy Communications Incorporated in the amount of $5,010.70 through a Northwest Municipal Conference Suburban Purchasing Cooperative Competitive Contract. Funding for the vehicle will be from the insurance fund in the amount of $33,496.70. It's for action. Second. Second. Alderman Braithway. Just a quick question. Who's the staff person on this? Can you good just, evening. Yeah. Uh, Sean Cholick, Facilities and Fleet Manager. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thanks. Can you just refresh my memory about this accident? It wasn't There wasn't enough information in the uh, packet. Sure. Um, actually, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Parrott would probably be best to answer any questions on the accident itself. Thanks. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the community. I mean, I'm members of the uh, committee. I'm sorry. Um, this this particular vehicle was uh, involved in an accident where an individual turned in front of the officers while he was driving. Uh, the officer was uh, slightly injured. Vehicle was totaled, and the individual that was driving the vehicle that committed the violation was uh, placed under arrest for uh, driving while intoxicated. Okay. Thanks for that reminder. Congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right, no further questions. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of this item, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Alderman Suffernan, A3.10, um, please. Uh, A310 is a purchase of a vehicle for the Evanston Fire Department from Foster Coach Sales. Uh, this is an ambulance in the amount of $291,730. That is I can second. See no lights, no question. Oh, I do. Let's, oh, okay. let's hear from the other chief. Ottoman Suffernan and then Ottoman Braithway. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I assume I've got, we're going to ask the same question. So yeah. tell me about this ambulance and uh, the one it replaces and the reason why we have to do it. Certainly. Please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, good evening. Fire Chief Brian Scott. Um, Alderman Suffered, and this ambulance is going to be replacing Fleet Ambulance 317, which is a 2005 International, so it's uh, 13 years old, and it's got about 89,000 miles uh, to that particular vehicle. Um, in terms of frontline service, it's going to go to uh, Station 22, and it's going to be replacing an ambulance that we'll put in reserve status, which is a 2012 International about 62,000 miles. Average lifespan for our ambulance is about five to six years. And again, typically we take the front line ambulance, front line ambulance and put it in reserve status and then use it as long as we can. So right now it's an issue for us in terms of the reserve ambulances of uh, reliability and cost to maintain. Okay, so do we have one that we're gonna be getting rid of through auction? Yes. As this goes through? That's okay. correct. Um, and then, uh, when we talk about miles on ambulances, is that like the relevant way to measure their use, or do we use engine hours also? Is there another way to measure, or is it just miles? It's, I think it's miles, um, and even that can't be the most accurate determination sometimes because these is what I kind of describe as hard miles. Right. When an ambulance is going 62,000 miles, those that's a lot of trips to, to, uh, to residences and to the hospitals, especially in our case at Evanston where we have two hospitals within our, our city jurisdiction. Okay. Right, or so, if we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, finish up, sorry. Man. So, um, and again, that cost to maintain is important, and we work closely with fleet services to make sure that we're, you know, being efficient, being stewards with, with the finances with respect to the cost of these ambulances, and we're getting the most usable life possible. Got it. So, again, the same question I asked Mr. Stonebeck, like, in your opinion, this is uh, essential and important? It is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alderman Braithwaite? Great, Great. moving forward, and... Else, I can't remember his name. Sean, can you just Sean? Just I would love to see the picture of the uh, totaled out vehicle. And for Chief, again, I know that you guys are 
uh, really good at budgeting and you're mindful of the taxpayer dollars, I would love to, because vehicle purchases come up all year, so you're not being picked on. It's something that we're going to have sure. to deal with throughout the rest of the year. I would love to get some information that I can read to educate myself. You know, my, my car has over 150 miles, and I drive it every day, and I drive it farther than the four by seven miles that it is to get to any place here in Evanston. So I would love to be able to do some education on my own. So I would love to, whatever you can send me to read, I'd appreciate it. I'll write um, it to you and to the rest of the council. Yeah, that would be great. That Certainly. would be great. And the total vehicle. Sure Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Madam Mayor Rainey has sir. a question as well. Should we have three working ambulances? Um, we have four working ambulances. I mean, should we have three ambulances on duty all the time? I think um, optimally that would be a benefit to the city. But it's um, in our current model, we have a, a jump ambulance at station three, um, where we do have a third ambulance that we're able to put in frontline service. Um, the trade off there, though, is that we have to take a fire company out of service to accomplish that mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. In certain times of the year when we have extra manning, we're able to actually put that third ambulance into service uh, without that sacrifice. Um, but um, that's a system that we've work, been working with for a number of years. Thank you. You're welcome. One uh, last, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so just remind me, when do residents see a city of Evanston ambulance versus like the private duty ones that we see all around the town? When we're operating under our plan two way, which is two frontline ambulances. Okay. The only time that they would see that is if those two frontline ambulances went in service, our third jump ambulance would go into service. So in effect, it would be a fourth ambulance in need in the city and we would bring in a neighboring community to do that. Now we're very, very fortunate in the city of Evanston that our fire companies, all of them, are ALS equipped with the equipment and paramedics. So in terms of response times initially to the residents, those are not compromised if we have to use the jump ambulance or a mutual aid ambulance. So, so that's a, a really a big benefit we need to focus on here. Thank you. All right, no further questions. All those in favor of approving item 3.11, I'm sorry, 3.10, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Where did we, who just did that one? Sorry, lost track. Autumn okay, Sufferton. thank you. Um, Autumn and Rainey, can you do 3.11, please? I'm on 11, right? Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we're being asked to approve the purchase of three vehicles for the Public Works uh, Department from Monroe Truck Equipment, uh, National Fleet Auto Group, and JX Peterbilt. Um, in the amount of, let's see, I'm, I'm going to start over here. Let's see. Um, these are three different vehicles. In the amount of Monroe truck equipment uh, is in the amount of $104,880. National Fleet Auto Group is in the amount of $171,726. And JX Peterbilt is in the amount of $137,131. Um, this is through the National Joint Powers Alliance contract. Um, I move approval. Second. Any questions? All right, seeing so you no know questions. Um, all those for approval of 3.11, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, item 3.12 is a single source purchase of Ford OME parts and vehicle service from Golf Mill Ford. Staff is recommended approval of contract with Golf Mill Ford in the amount of $82,511 for automotive parts and services on city vehicles. Um, this is coming through, well, the funds listed here, and this will be for parts that cover through March 2018 through February 2019. This is for action. Second. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> All right. Ottoman Braithway 313, please. Uh, staff recommends the approval of the lowest response and responsive bid for the watercraft maintenance and repair service. Uh, bid number 1811. Um, that's going to be in the dollar amount of uh, 31,158 and 25 cents for the period of uh, April 
2018 through March uh, 31st of uh, 2019. I can second. 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 Any questions? All right. All those for approval, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Alderman Ruth Simmons, please do 8 through 314. Staff re requests approval to renew a three-year contract with HOH Water Technology Incorporated, a sole vendor to continue service providing chemical treatment of water, HVAC systems, and various city facilities. The contract include three one-year extensions subject to acceptable performance of the vendor. The total cost of the three-year contract is 40341 which includes a 1.5% increase each year. Um, this is for action. Second. Second. See no questions. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Alderman Suffern and A4. Sure. Um, A4 is an ordinance approving the construction of a local improvement known as Evanston Special Assessment Number 1523. Uh, and it is the paving of the alley north of Payne and east of McDaniel uh, through the special assessment process. This is for introduction. Second. I have a uh, technical question, I guess. Is there any, Alderman Rusim, is this is your ward, is that correct? Where am I looking? McDaniel and Payne? I believe it is my ward. Oh, it's your ward. I'm sorry. Of course. Uh, is it possible to do introduction and action? Is there anything we need to discuss no, no, about no, no, that? No. Oh, we can't? Okay. All right. Is there anybody here who wants to speak to it? Do we have nobody signed up on the list for this? No. Mm -hmm. what, what is the rule here? Well, You're, typically he would have requested. Okay. I just didn't. We're trying to move it yeah. along. All right. No problem. So that's for introduction. So we have no speakers, no questions. All right. All right. Um, do we have to move for introduction? Yeah. I do. Sorry. So we had a, um, all those for approval or introduction, A.4, A please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, Alderman um, Rainey, A5, please. Yes. Um, this is Ordinance 38018, which amends the City Code 3179 regarding the Senior Citizen uh, and Persons with Disability Taxi Program. Um, this in, the amendment includes an increase in the participant share from $4 to 5 and changes the boundaries of the program to within the corporate boundaries of the City of Evanston. Um, this was held on March 12 until April 9 today, um, and staff is recommending that we move uh, to suspend the rules and take uh, move introduction and action this evening. Um, I therefore move suspension, introduction, and action. Second. Thank you. Alderman Suffernan and then Alderman Braithway for questions. Uh, I had a uh, constituent reach out about this uh, sure. and uh, tell me that this would be a hardship for him. Could you just help me understand the process by which it was determined to raise it a dollar and to limit the mm -hmm. boundaries. Sure. Um, Audrey Thompson, Ombudsman, City of Evanston. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, back when we increased the amount from $3 to $4, the amount had not been raised in over 10 years. And um, initially, we wanted to go up to $5, but thought that to go up from $3 to $5 would be um, a pretty huge increase. Um, so we decided to increase it from $3 to $4, but also to um, increase the, the boundaries. Um, that really um, did not work to the advantage of many of our riders because they got a lot of backlash from the cab companies because they did not feel that there was a fair fare. And so um, when we look at the rates for taxi cab, um, you know, the actual rides and, and where people are going, um, the whole coupon is worth $10. And at that time in October 2016, we did a 60-40 split. So the city ate 60% and then the rider 40%. So now with the move to the debit card, um, you know, it's a 50-50 subsidy. And so if we're going to be fair for the individuals who are receiving the subsidy on the debit card side, then we want to be fair to both. In addition to that, we want to make sure that the cab drivers are getting a fair fare when taking our riders to and from. Um, and are you open to including uh, rideshare companies in the future? 
So we have, we've met with ride share companies for the paper coupons. And the, so that's why we're wanting to move to the debit because with the debit card, there's no limit. They can use Amtrak, Uber, Lyft, any of those. So, um, we, we want people to eventually move from the coupons to the debit card. However, we feel that we as a city, as staff, have to do our due diligence and make sure that people are educated in how to use a debit card, um, as well as how to use a smartphone if they're going to, to get uh, an Uber or Lyft. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Honorable Braithway. Just a quick question sure. and, a, and a comment. I apologize, I missed the last meeting when you presented this. You sure. know, one of the concerns coming out of uh, human services that I had is just, you know, just a few times I would hear complaints from our seniors regarding how they were treated in right. those brief interactions. So my first question is, uh, Ms. Thompson, is have you figured out a way to better capture those complaints and feedbacks from our seniors that are either not picked up or not dropped off where they want to be dropped off. Right. And also I realize that there's some that have an expectation that the driver is going to help them with taking yeah. their bags in the house. I mean, the list goes on and on. How are you capturing those? Um, so, so I think, you know, changing the program initially, we thought about moving directly to the debit card. Mm -hmm. um, and after, eight, nine focus groups, uh, we felt that that was not a good decision at the time. Sure. Um, but we feel that moving eventually to the debit card will take away some of that mm -hmm. because the cab drivers have no idea of who's, who's on a subsidy. Sure. So if they're, if they're using the debit card, then they can go wherever and the cab driver will receive the full fare. Right. And then the amount totally is subsidized up yeah. to a limit amount, Fair depending enough. on a person's income. So we feel that we'll take away some of that. Um, right now, if a person um, has any problem with the, a cab driver, he or she um, would need to call 311 and make a report. Um, I always um, advise um, riders not to argue with the cab drivers, um, to simply say, you know, this is the program, I have a coupon, I'm paying with the, pro with the coupon, either call the dispatch or if you feel like I'm committing a crime, call the police. Most times when you say that, they leave them alone. Perfect. So the wonderful thing about the debit card, and, I'm, and this is my question for you, is if a senior uses the debit card, unlike the cards where you can't keep yeah. track, does the debit card leave that electronic footprint of this was the company, this was the time that they've been, just in case yes. you have to go back and look at a report for that specific senior? Right. So we'll be able to track all of that as far as um, which company they use to, to hail a cab or, right. you know, get an Uber. Um, the other part about the debit card is if an individual, if you lose your coupon now, it's lost. Right, right now we can cut it off. Um, and also when we're talking about balances um, on the card. There's a number on the card they can call to find out their, their balance, but they can also call 311 to That's get a balance. Right. So there are a lot of um, you know benefits to moving, mm -hmm. and that's why eventually we want to move totally to the card and, and take away the yeah. coupons. Yeah, um, yeah eventually. So my last final comment is just really thank you. Oh, I mean, doing anything that creates change is always difficult. And I know staff worked really, really hard to get this right. And I can use one of my seniors in our church who mm -hmm. started off like really concerned. And I would see her every single Sunday and, and hear the anxiety in the voice. And just over the last couple of months of your focus group, she, Miss Lamond, <laughs> who you probably know very well, is comfortable and you've moved her from anxiety to neutral, mm -hmm. willing to try. So, so we're hoping you. to move her from neutral to it's the perfect <laughs> program. Let's move. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so all those in favor of item A5, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. So we had two no's. Alderman Rainey, Alderman Suffernan. Aye. Oh, you're aye. Okay. okay. Just, oh, Alderman Ruth Simmons, I'm sorry. You were a no. Okay. All right. Thank you. So does that carry still, right? We have three yeah. yeses? All right, thank you. All right, item 3-6 is ordinance 43-0-18, decreasing the number of Class C liquor licenses for Lao something beautiful, mm -hmm. at 1633 Orrington Avenue. Um, staff recommends that we adopt this new ordinance, amending the city code to decrease the number of authorized 
Class C liquor licenses from 26 to 25. Um, staff recommends suspension of the rules for introduction and action. Um, can I get a second? Second. Second. Any comment? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Alderman Ruth Simmons, can you do um, A7, please? Yes. Staff recommends City Council adoption of Ordinance 44018, amending City Code subsection 346D to decrease the number of authorized Class D liquor licenses from 50 to 49, Las Palmas Res Restaurant of Evanston doing business as Las Palmas. Um, this staff recommends suspension of the rules and introduction and action. Second. All right, seeing no lights for discussion, all those um, in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and we have two items for discussion. We don't have any speakers, so we can let's start those. Yeah. All right, Alderman Suffern, can you do the first one? Uh, sure. Uh, this is a discussion of a Sherman Plaza parking garage rooftop fence at the request of Alderman Fisk. Is Alderman Fisk in the council chambers? Where is she? She called me. She does want to discuss this. I mean, do we want to hold it then? No, is there anything urgent? Here. That when my phone rang, I apologize. That was her calling. So. Uh, city manager, do you know? That's okay. We're on. We're on the item. The fence. The do you have a dis? We are on the item for discussion for the Sherman Plaza parking fence, and we didn't know if Alderman Fisk oh, was course. here to discuss. Yeah, I, Alderman Fisk had said she was going to try to attend, uh, but I can run through the staff report. Can we hold it? She's here. Okay, oh. We can hold it. She's she's back there speaking, so we'll go to the next one and. Okay, very Come good. back. All right. So, um, Autumn and Suffernan. Sure. Uh, APW2, <coughs> the administration, Administrative Adjudication Report, uh, pursuant to your request, Chairwoman Fleming. Yes, this is my request. Uh, staff submits a report on the administration, Administrative Hearings Division caseload costs and statistics for discussion. All right. So, I had a question. Who is the staff for this one? Thank you. Um, so this came up for me because I've, I'm here some days, and some days we have a lot of people, and some days we have no people. I was here with a resident in my ward who we came, and she was the only person here. Um, and so I guess I would like to, these numbers were helpful, but I guess I would like to know a couple of things. So who schedules the time? Does the um, attorney schedule their own caseload? Is someone scheduling that for them? Are we making sure that we are scheduling that so that we're making the most efficient use of the paid staff? Um, also, there's this breakdown here of whether people appeal online, written, or in person. And if you could just clarify that for me, is that whether you appeal online, written, or person, you come in to speak to the judge, or I just want to make sure that we are not um, paying people and that we're not sure. getting the most for our money there. Sure. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee again. Uh, Alex Thorpe is revenue manager. Also, I manage the administrative hearings division. Uh, to the first point, the, the tickets are kind of broken out in two ways. I think best to look at them. Parking tickets are separate kind of than the compliance tickets, which the police write, property standards, health division. When the police write their tickets or property, the, the hearing date is already set on the ticket. So when you are given that citation, there's a predefined hearing date on the ticket. If you'd like to change the date, you'd request it through the hearings division officer uh, who staffs here full time Monday through Friday, and then they kind of make the paperwork happen where they'll move the date from the docket from the original date to the date at the request. And so when that happens, there's also kind of a hold that's put on the, the hearing to not allow late fees or anything like that be applied to the ticket. Uh, similar process with parking tickets, it's kind of the same way. Uh, the parking tickets are heard two times on Wednesday. There's a 9.30 call and a 1 o'clock call, kind of the same premise, that the, the person, when they're written the ticket, actually those ones don't have a predefined date. It's you could call within the 10 days before a letter is generated. If there's no payment on the ticket, there's an automatic, what they call a 10-day letter that's issued out that sets a, a default judgment date. So if they don't show up the de default judgment date, then there's a default judgment basically saying there was a no-show, the, the citation stays, uh, and then there's still another legal recourse that they can basically do a motion to set aside default judgment and say, hey, I missed the court date, I had work, I had something, and the judge then would kind of put you back on a hearing date. So there are kind of different ways that you can kind of move the date around, and they are really kind of out there to let the residents, they're not stuck on that one part particular day. So who is in charge of so that calendar? So if, if we have a 
you know, judge set to come on sure. Monday or whatever the day is, and they only have two people on the docket. Mm-hmm. Is someone looking at that and saying, okay, let's move those people to the afternoon? So we, And then if that happens, are we paying the judge for half time, or is the judge paid for the whole day? Well, the judge is only paid for the time that they work appealing any of the, 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 the cases. So if there is a call, say, that's an in-person hearing, only one or two people on the morning call, most of the rest of the day they're going to be doing online parking t- ticket contesting. So there's that aspect, too, that they might not be in here, but they're actually in their office going through all the online tickets. So that, obviously, with the online contesting of parking tickets, is a lot bigger volume than the in-person or even the written tickets where they actually physically submit the application with their appeal, their evidence. They're kind of going through that behind the scenes, if you will. Okay, so... Your anyway. second question, I had not get to it. Uh, I forgot what you had, like a two-parter. Um, it was is someone making sure that we're, you know, if there's only two people coming in that day, we can maybe move those cases to another day so we don't have the... Yeah, the, and so the dates kind of the seat tickets are kind of predefined on the, the ticket, um, and then they do run them on specific days. So Tuesdays are police tickets, Wednesdays are parking tickets, and then Thursdays are kind of property standards or... Uh, they could be emergency tow hearings. So those are kind of set, and the judge would make the decision if, say, a parking ticket wants to be heard on a Thursday. Very rare that it happened. They tend to keep them on those court dates in which that they're kind of set on a schedule. Okay. And then, thank you very much. Um, City Manager, I have a question for you. I know in the memo it said that there is one position that's open. Are we planning to keep that one open? Are we, are we functioning okay with just one person in this department? I'm thinking about budget again, right? Is this a position that we don't need? We can save the money? Do we need this extra person? Alderman, uh, Fleming, members of the committee, uh, I think the whole issue of administrative adjudication is ripe for further discussion. I'm ahead of my time then. Okay. So I guess no one else has any questions about this? Well, no. I mean, we're... We're moving at a, at a snail's pace, but we're also looking at administrative adjudication, but through the lenses of the alternatives to arrests or examine the fees that are associated with some of the offenses to juveniles. And, I mean, I think when we last discussed it with Marty, whereas Wolf, that you were just in the process of transitioning to a new updated system. Have you gotten to the point where all the system is out of the, excuse me, all the information is out of the old access file and into the new software. So before, when we were looking at the numbers, it was like an old access file, right. so it would take forever. Well, uh, so we kind of put a hold on the software update in the meantime until we kind of figured out uh, kind of the whole breadth of what we're doing with administrative hearings. So right now, we do still have, we're in contact with the vendor due to the upgrade right. um, that you're referring to, but we haven't actually implemented it yet. We did wait. We're Part of phase one, if you will, was kind of getting our cashiering system in. And then once that was in and fully integrated, we'd be able to move tickets digitally kind of from when they're written to that cashiering system and reduce paperwork flow back and forth. So what's the timeline then to migrate the data into something that we can use more efficiently than where we are right now? Uh, I, I don't believe actually a hard decision has been made that we're going to purchase the upgrade yet. What was I the think cost of the information? I think I recall you presenting that it was few, I, several months ago. It was ballparking about 15000 Okay. So, it, yeah, it was, but again, without going to specifics, but that was sort of what the vendor gave as like a first go. All right. We'll put that on our follow-up list. Thank All right. you. Alderman Rainey had a question as well. Um, here is what I would like to be able to do. I would like to be able to look at this information and say, here are all the expenses. We've had this discussion. I'm just, yeah, like six Here's months ago. all the revenue we take in. Oh, look, when I subtract all of the expenses from all of the revenue, I can tell you that administrative adjudication costs the taxpayers of right. Evanston X. money or no money. Uh, that, that's what I want to know. Yeah. And I, there's no way. I mean, there, these numbers are, are huge. The, the total number of tickets written, the total number of of health department tickets that are written. They're they're just enormous numbers here, but I'm not seeing any dollars. And so I I the the judges payments, uh, their salaries are separate from I guess from like Renee and and those folks, that's separate. There's no way to I can't tell. 
Well, Alderman Ray, to your point, the ticket that generally is written goes to the department that wrote it. Hearings is just sort of the hearings division, so when they're adjudicated, the revenue doesn't necessarily go to the hearings division. But I, I really want to know how much that is so that I can then put it all together so that I know is it worth having administrative adjudication? Is it is it more economically efficient to do it this way as opposed to doing it the other way out at circuit court? I that's why we did this. And I I know there's a way to tell how much it costs for us to operate administrative adjudication. I know that there's a way to do that. So Alderman Rainey, members of the committee, page 401 of the packet. Um, I think the revenue... Uh, I'm, that's so, what I'm looking at. I think the revenue numbers are, are uh, the question mark. And so the number, the revenue that we attribute to this are non-parking ordinance violations and miscellaneous revenue uh, that uh, is budgeted current year 262,000. Last year was something uh, less than that, 159. Uh, the cost associated with the expenses uh, last year, 187, 967. Um, budget uh, this year, 232, 371. Um, so just based on the information in front of you, as I said, I, I think there's an opportunity here to look further. Um, Again, as, as, as Mr. Thorpe has mentioned, not all revenue that comes through adjudication is attributed here, uh, so there is some additional revenue. But clearly it's close now, just based on the revenue we're attributing to it. Um, are there opportunities to, to go to an all online process? Uh, and what are the associated costs with that? Uh, if we get out of the adjudication business completely and then let those items go back to uh, Cook County, uh, what is the cost associated with that? What are we really gaining through the process? And I think that's a legitimate question uh, for us to be looking at as we move forward with the budget. And I think the information that Mr. Thorpe's provided this evening, it gives you a flavor that it's probably worth our time to explore further. I think it is. Alderman Brayway. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other thing, just as a follow-up to Alderman Rainey's comments, and City Manager, I have to apologize my memory. I, I can't access my old email since we migrated over, but I remember when we sat in the office with Marty, somewhere in my foggy memory, there was somewhere around, I think, maybe 1.3, somewhere in the millions of dollars uh, in outstanding fines, uncollected. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was a very long process to pull data to figure that out. And I remember it well because it was right around the time that we were looking at the amnesty program for the tickets. So I I don't know why it's, I'm not gonna say it's not a priority, I don't understand why we put that on hold. And I think that million dollars figuring out along with Alderman Rainey's questions, along with uh, Alderman Fleming's questions and the questions that I had of course around the administrative adjudication, excuse me, around the alternatives to arrest, I'd like for that to start moving again. I say that to both of you. Certainly, and the new chief financial officer starts in a week. Perfect, there you go. All right, I have one more last question for this. I just realized, um, how did we decide that the non-parking ordinance violations was going to go up $100,000 this year? Right, so last year it was budgeted at 152, this year it's budgeted at 250. on page 401. Right. right. Uh, I mean, the numbers that show are the actual, so I, I don't know the budget from it, it was 250. Uh, generally, the budget kind of stayed relatively flat. There was a couple of uh, tickets I know that we sent out, like additional letters to that we anticipated like further enforcement on. Um, but in terms of the budget, it's pretty rel it's relatively flat. The actual is kind of, when they come in, that's what uh, are on this page, the 152, 188. Those are the actuals. You had amnesty, is that? Oh, I, I don't know. I just I'm looking at, and maybe I'm not reading this correctly, but I'm looking at the number, you know, the actual in the budget. There's, a, you know, quite a huge difference there. So I'm just trying to figure out what our. Maybe I'm reading this wrong. You are not reading it. Wrong. Okay, so that's it's a hundred thousand dollar difference, and as Alderman Braithwaite has said, the City Council has directed us to be more aggressive in collecting fines. Okay, so. but not more. We're not writing more tickets. Oh yeah. But we, I mean, I think it's a combination of all of those things, but I think certainly the direction from the city council is to be more aggressive overall, and so we're trying to do that. But this is not going to be nitpicking on tickets alone. Well, we have more tickets written. We, we want to make sure that we're doing that, but at the same time, we want to collect what's owed to us. Okay, so does anyone make a, do we want to make another referral for a more detailed report, or do we feel 
the staff has heard what we're looking for. I mean, I mean they heard. And he mentioned as soon as we have a new CFO, CFO. in place, it gets. I'm assuming it's I've going asked to be Mr. Prior. Desai um, already in our, our discussions prior to his arrival uh, that uh, you know these issues need to be on his plate. One of the things we've done now uh, with the reconfiguration of the chief financial officer's responsibilities is refocused on finance. Uh, Mr. Lyons had other citywide portfolio issues uh, that Mr. Desai will not, and so he will have more time to focus on these matters. So, uh, thank you. We hear you loud and clear. All right. Thank you. All right, so let's go back to APW1, the Sherman Plaza parking garage rooftop fence. Um, this is for discussion. Alderman Fisk. Hi, everybody. Um, so I've asked for this to come back to council. Um, as you probably remember, we had another incident on the Sherman Avenue parking garage with an attempted suicide. Um, I think that lasted four to five hours. I don't know whether Chief is here or not, but um, anyway, the response from both the police and fire was um, substantial. Uh, the good news is that the uh, uh, attempted uh, suicide was averted through the good work of our police and fire department, so I appreciate that uh, very much. But clearly something needs to be done on the roof um, of the Sherman um, Avenue uh, parking garage. So I'm asking for this to come back to uh, council. The last um, estimate we had for it was around $24,000 with funding coming from the parking fund. And Mr. City Manager, I don't remember how much is in the parking fund, but I think it's enough. I think there's enough to cover cover this. So, um, so that's my request to you. Again, the amount of time that's put in by the um, uh, first responders, uh, I think, more would more than cover the, the cost of the fence. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing problem. The fence is a deterrent. It's not going to prevent suicides, but it is going to give people a pause that uh, might mean the difference between life and death. So I, um, I encourage you to uh, consider this, and hopefully we can move it forward this time at council. That's it. If you have any questions, let Alderman, me know. Alderman Rainey has a question. So... Alderman Fisk, yes. would it be a chain link fence? Yes, it would be a six foot chain link fence that I believe Mr. City Manager is angled at the top. Maybe. Again, the, uh, Alderman, many members of the committee, the, when we came last before you in 2014, uh, that was the, the plan to do that. Could you speak up a little? I'm it's, sorry. Is it going to be? barbed wire in the top? There is not going to be barbed wire at the top. So it was the, the quote that is on page 397 of, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, agenda packet uh, discusses how this would be. It would be uh, uh, pipe is vinyl coated, fence framework, uh, galvanized steel pipe. Post will be anchored to the concrete wall with two wall brackets. Each bracket will have a two, uh, two half inch threaded rod epoxy set with uh, uh, brackets and things, so no, no, no barbed wire. So basically, just a fence um, with with a, a curvature, so that that would discourage us to make it harder to climb over. And I would like, if the council's interested in doing this, I'd like to refresh our uh, research on this. We did not, for the purposes of this evening's discussion, we just brought to you what you, we had last brought four years ago. So this is something interest will refresh the, the uh, work, make sure that this is still a standard configuration that other communities are using, and come back at a future meeting. All right, Alderman Braithway. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Alderman Fisk. I mean, this is, this is one of those tough conversations that, you know, continue to be recycled, and I just want to, uh, for the new members of council, um, and, and again, not out of any disrespect to those that find themselves in that situation. The concern is I don't think we could build a fence high enough. And if someone wants to harm themselves, that the fence isn't necessarily going to deter that. And that's just where we left things before. I mean, I feel like if there was, and I don't say this with any humor, but with sincerity, if there was a barbed wire or something that prevented someone from being able to climb up that fence, I would be more inclined to to even explore it and to be able to see it. I mean, no one wants this to happen, whether it's on that rooftop or anywhere else in town. It's just a very tough reality that we have to deal with. And so the question would be, before I could be supportive, I almost want to make sure that 
the safest fence possible that's not going to make us liable for something else is something that is given some consideration versus just a fence that's a little bit higher that someone can just climb over and then hurt themselves. Right, and I think that the angle of the top part of the fence is uh, su supposed to address that. I, I honestly don't know about the legal question about using a razor I, wire yeah. or something like I was that. Just following up on what Alderman and, said. And uh, Alderman Braithwaite, as you know, and this is, I think, the third time yeah. in my years here that we've yeah. talked about this. And um, I think that there are various schools of thought, quite frankly. Certainly right. the one that you raise is that no fence is high enough. Uh, there's concerns that people, uh, you know, find themselves in further danger because of right. a fence and how it is, it is it is placed there. And those are all discussions that the council has had over, over right. the years on this subject. So uh, I think from your staff's perspective, we are not experts on this. Uh, I think two times ago, I think we reached out to experts, and I think they, they were inconclusive of, of what uh, even experts in this area think I, don't, is, I couldn't is imagine any so. fence company wanting to take the liability or making that statement. Well, they wouldn't. They, they, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, they would, the liability is all ours. So right. any anything that is added to the parapet at this parking garage or really any of our taller right. sites, it would be the city's responsibility. I recall the first time we uh, did this, which was probably 2012, 2011, you know, there was a lot of discussion on mm -hmm. the council. Uh, I think I remember Alderman Rainey, um, you know, bringing up, should we put something further down? And, and if someone then falls and catches themselves and impales themselves <laughs> on some sort of structure that is, you know, below the, the top, some communities have tried that, a netting of some sort. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, what we settled on the last time we discussed this was what Alderman uh, uh, um, Fisk is describing, which is the, the best of the possible scenarios. So again, Madam Chair, if, if you'd like us to uh, ha refresh this information, look and see if there's been any uh, new uh, research, new developments on this topic in the last four years, we're happy to do that. Um, well, again, there's just a lot of energy and time involved, and really before we did anything, we just wanted to come and get direction from the committee. Alderman Rainey had another comment. Yeah, I think we should do what uh, Wally just suggested, and that is reach out and see if there is anything we can do that would substantially uh, deter or detract from anyone taking a leap. Uh, I guess, I'm sorry, say that again, Alderman Rainey. More research by the should, staff. I think we should do some research and do what Wally suggested, and that is reach out into that community and see what what is out there. If there is some kind of fencing or preventative method that we could um, we could pursue to to help out here. Mm -hmm. I, I guess then to the city manager is now are we opening up Pandora's box? It's so, not going to cost us anything. Well, no, no, no. To I'm just saying. So if you're looking at to one, do some research. I'm completely, completely fine with to hear me out. So if we're looking at that one garage, are we now looking at all of the garages? That is entirely at the council's direction. Okay. I mean, we we certainly have had while well, the Sherman garage. Uh, seems to have more activity than the rest. It is not exclusive. I mean, certainly the Maple Avenue garage has had a handful that I could think of off the top of my head. Right. Uh, you know, there there are issues around all of this. I mean, we've talked, I think, previously about signage. We've talked about emergency phones. So the people, if they were if they wanted an opportunity to reach out to a suicide hotline. Uh, but again, we'd be happy to bring back all of that information and refresh it uh, with anything that might be new. We would it will just take us. I think certainly we would ask to come back at your second meeting in May. Um, that would be that would give us you know four or six weeks to do that. All right. So it sounds like there's no objections to you doing that. So we'll do more research and come back, and we'll, and we'll have another discussion. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. There are no communications tonight, so I'm going to move that we adjourn this second. meeting, and we will begin um, planning and development. Oh, sorry. I need a second. Oh, Alderman, I need a second. We need to move it forward. All right, so planning and development will start at 7.30? No. All right, thank you.